Nigeria was formerly called the Royal Niger Company Territories, founded in 1886 by Sir George Dashwa Topman Goldie. The Royal Niger Company was the 19th century British mercantile company, formed in 1879 as the United Company. It got renamed to National Company in 1881 before the name Royal Niger Company in 1886. It didn't sound like a country name at all and that was why in 1886 the name Nigeria was given in place of the Royal Niger Company by Lady Flora Shaw. She referred to the area as Nigeria after the Niger River which ran through the country. Flora Shaw combined the words Niger the country's longest river and area to get the word Nigeria. The concept of the name Nigeria was not in existence many years ago, but with the passage of time, it came to be. But before then, it will not be out of place to establish that in history, there are three fundamentals or essentials. One is the past, the present, and the future. History is established strongly on these three areas that a good knowledge of the past enables one to understand what is happening in the present. And with the ultimate aim of chanting a better future or tomorrow. Historically, the name Nigeria was not in existence. The original name of Nigeria was British Royal Niger Company Territories, which was a creation of the British colonial government. The name British Royal Niger Company's territories did not represent the name of a nation or country. It doesn't sound uh, as such. So that the strong reason and justification for a suitable name to be sought for. And based on historical records and sources, the name Nigeria has it is today is a name that was essentially given by one lady, Flora Shah, who later to be uh, referred to as Lady Frederick Lugard. So Flora Frederick Lugard, she happened to be the wife of the British colonial governor general of Nigeria, who was then referred to as Lieutenant Colonel uh, Frederick Lugard. So when she got married to him, she, with the situation that was on ground, when the need, in other words, arose for the territory called Nigeria today to be given a very suitable and acceptable name uh, in line with the realities of the day at that time, Frederick uh, Lady Lugard, uh, Frederick decided to give the geographical entity or area that is called Nigeria today, the name Nigeria. This is, according to historical account, how the name Nigeria came to be. Uh, having said that, it is also very important to also stress that uh, Nigeria, geographically and historically, the name was a derivative of uh, River Niger. So the name Nigeria lies within River Niger. It is very correct to say so, uh, based on historical truths and facts that are at our disposal. So the name, in other words, was derived from River Niger. So that was how the name Nigeria was coined and given, and it is in use up to this um, uh, moment. I also need to say very clearly, without any 
contradiction or fear of contradiction, the fact that uh, the British Royal Niger Company territories was mainly established to seek for British economic interests in Africa and precisely Nigeria. This company was established in order to meet the material need of the industries that were established in England or what was hitherto known as Great Britain. There was a very good historical development that took place in the 19th century. Historians and students of history are very aware of this development. In the 19th century, Britain established or became an industrialized nation. And the industries they established needed raw materials to keep them uh, operational. So for that, the British government in England decided to uh, seek for material or natural resources in Africa. And Nigeria was one of the places that was very viable for the acquisition of the raw materials to be shipped from Nigeria to Britain so that the industries that already came up in England uh, will be operational. So that was the nomenclature or the main reason why the British government decided to establish the British Royal Niger Company territories. They were referred to as territories because the areas that British conquered by a way of colonization through the usage of superior political and military might and power over the uh, African territories were uh, areas that came under their complete control. So that was what gave birth to the name British Royal Niger Company territories. They were territories in the sense that they were conquered by uh, 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 the British government. So in other words, it is also correct to say that the British Royal Niger Company territories were or was an extension of the British power or precisely political power in England outside Great Britain. So they exercised their power even outside the Great Britain area. So this is very, very uh, important in historical uh, cycle or balance. Uh, it is also important to also say that the name Nigeria came into existence in the 19th century that Lady Flora Shah, who later became uh, Lady Flora Lok Lugat, gave the name Nigeria. That is what is obtainable uh, in historical cycle. I also need to say that based on the three fundamentals or essentials of history that I mentioned initially, which are the past, the present, and future. The present as it is today. Nigeria, there is no nation that is called Nigeria. Nigeria is a country, it is a nation state that is living in an ideal form. Ideally, we have the name Nigeria, but in the real practice or in practical terms, there is no nation that is called Nigeria. The reason is that Nigeria is a nation that have multiplicity of nation state existing within a nation. For instance, you have the nation state of the Anabuze people, who are popularly known as the Buji. You have the nation state of the Azele 
people who are popularly known as the Jere people. You have the nation state of the Magavun, of the Birom, of the Afizere, of the Anaguta, of the Idoma, of the Igala, and of the Tula and Tangale people. This is the real situation that Nigeria finds itself in today. So Nigeria, in other words, is existing in principle. It is existing in principle, but in practical and concrete terms, without any fear of contradiction, I would like to say that Nigeria is existing in principle. There is no country that is Nigeria in concrete uh, terms, except in principle uh, uh, terms. In principle, yes, of course, there is a country that other nations of the world refer to it as Nigeria. But based on the realities on ground, based on the prevailing circumstance, based on the truth, we can safely establish and say without any doubt that Nigeria is not in existence in practical terms. But in principle, Nigeria is in existence as a nation as it is referred to. Being a recognized citizen of a country automatically allows you its benefits, which may include right to vote and be voted for, right to life and liberty, right to education, right to own a private property, and the right to employment, amongst others. Now, as a citizen of Nigeria, would you say these benefits are applicable to all Nigerians in every level? As a Nigerian, I feel there are benefits and also there are no benefits of being a Nigerian. Well, the benefiting factor is that we have abundance of natural resources and then we have millions and thousands of job opportunities. All you have to do is just go out there and search. You can be an entrepreneur. You can help yourself out there. To be a Nigerian is a blessing. Although some people say it's a blessing in disguise. But I believe to be a Nigerian has so many numerous blessings. Um, being a giant of Africa, um, it has really positioned us to have better ideas and how to live within and how to live within ourselves and how to promote tolerance. So Nigeria was not uh, uh, has not really had its way on the right path. But the truth is this: being a Nigerian has helped me to know better the different tribes and to live amongst ourselves. And I also want to say this, Nigeria is a great country. We have made so much mark in the world. And, um, and yet, we are backward in Nigeria. But I believe projecting Nigeria externally will bring a greater idea for us to move forward. And secondly, being a Nigerian is a thing of pride. Being in Nigerian, it's a thing. Even the international world wants to be recognized with us. But I want us to put our hands on deck to move this country greater. Nigeria has the fastest growing economy in Africa and the highest gross national product, GNP, on the continent. It also has the largest population in Africa and the third largest manufacturing sector. The country also has the largest agricultural output and the highest number of cattle. Nigeria has a rich culture. There is no country in the world with the diversity, confidence, talent and black pride like Nigeria. To make this country a better place, do not ask who will, ask instead. How will I make Nigeria great?
My name is Debbie Mays, and I'm on staff with the Great Commission Movement globally, and here for the 50th anniversary of the Great Commission Movement of Nigeria. Please, please keep watching Equa Television Africa. While masses in Nigeria struggle with reports of enduring forbidding hardship without a speck of optimism that they can make it from day to day, their representatives look in another direction without a feeling of conscience or shame. Democratic Tradition in Nigeria A production of Echo Television Africa My name is Kaneng Bulus and I've been doing this business for the past 17 years. Honestly, before, the market is far better than what it is now. Now, everything is very difficult, but still yet, we do manage. Nothing is easy in the market, but we are still managing to see what God will do. My name is Sunday Audu. I start this business, this mechanic work for 1994. I have about 30 years of doing this work. When we started this business, everything was affordable and everything was there for you to use. Unlike today, when you can almost not be able to afford anything. It's like uh, we are moving backwards in Nigeria today. In the stead of finding a long-lasting solution to a shameful political tradition, delegates have worsened the situation by selecting for Nigerians politicians who will give them more cash in exchange of their votes. What can then be termed as exemplary leadership in Nigeria? with a highly corrupt political footing such as this. Recently, the delegates went for their various conventions and only God knows how many millions each of them went with. 
And here we are traders, not a dime from all these millions came in our direction. Some of these monies will have been channeled to business people to improve their businesses, but none of them got anything. And we are here suffering, sometimes you sell and there's no profit. Because some of these things are very expensive in the market. Sometimes you cannot even afford to buy things in the market because some of these things are very expensive. What is happening in today's politics is totally amazing because everything is one-sided. Only the rich are elected into positions of power. This work we are doing right now, we are just fulfilling all righteousness. Because the common saying goes, if two elephants fight, it is the grass that bears the weight. We have become the grass that is suffering in Nigeria. We suffer, we fight, we vote, and at the end of the day, we elect someone into office, but the person does not look back in our direction. After everything, they don't think about the poor people who voted them into offices of power. We stay under the sun for several hours to elect a candidate, to vote for someone, but at the end, nobody comes back to remember those who actually participated in the voting. No electricity, no good roads, no social amenities. We just try on our own to do things, but at the end, there is nothing. I started voting in 1996 after I got married. We have been voting for all this while, but the way we used to vote is quite different from how we vote now. In those days, we didn't have voter's card. What you just do is to queue up, wait for the cards that would be shared to you, and then you use it to cast your vote. Thereafter, everyone goes back home. Now we have voter's card and that is what everyone is using. Since they brought the voter's card, I continued voting. And I still have my card with me intact. The things to correct in Nigerian politics are too much. If the money is allocated for the traders can be given to the traders, it will go a long way instead of those who are in charge of the money sitting on it. Because these monies don't come to the traders at the end. For instance, if Buhari gives money to the traders and it comes to the traders, it will go a long way. Recently, we were asked to bring passports and all of us brought passports. But only those who know people in power got something. The rest of us went back empty-handed. This shows some elements of selfishness. If the fate of Nigeria's politics is kept in the hands of money-back politicians and delegates who are supposed to select experienced and vendable contestants for their political parties have abandoned such role, what tradition are the politicians in Nigeria cultivating? When we started this work, in those days, we didn't have phones. Customers will come all the way to your house to look for you to fix their cars. Even with the phones now, it is difficult to get a phone call that will lead to a job. Even the car owners don't find life easy. Some of them have parked their cars for five years, for three years. They are not able to use their cars on the roads because there is no money, no fuel. 
You can't use the money you have to buy fuel and go home and sleep hungry. This would not work. Those of us who have this kind of work don't find it easy. We are in a situation. If government can help traders and send money to us directly, because we are into small scale business, so the moment we touch the profit, the business scatters. If we are empowered, we will do the same business on a bigger level. Sometimes you are scared to touch the money from the business, so you spend the whole day without eating anything. Because if you touch the money, you might not come out tomorrow to sell. The negativity in Nigeria is without a doubt a celebrated consequence for those in power because no one pays any mind to the plight of the nation. If Nigeria is left in the hands of those who care less about it to decide its direction, what is left of Nigeria? What is the future of our country, Nigeria? Hi, I am Crystal Legrand, coming to you from Legrand Voyage in the Caribbean. I'm Yvette McNutt. Hi, I'm Ariel. Hi, I'm Dennis McNutt. Keep watching Equa TV. We support them everywhere in the world. Keep watching Equa Television. Keep watching Equa Television. Keep watching Equa Television. Keep watching Equa Television. Please keep watching Equa Television. Keep watching Equa Television. Showing up to win. June 12 was formerly known as Abiola Day and often celebrated in Lagos, Nigeria and some southwestern states of Nigeria. Remarkably, on the 12th of June 1993, presidential elections were held in Nigeria. The elections were the outcome of a transitional process to civilian rule spearheaded by the military ruler Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida. The unofficial result of the election, which was not declared by the National Electoral Commission at the time, indicated a victory for Moshud Olawale Abiola of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, who defeated Bashir Tofa of the National Republican Convention and RC. The winner of the election, MKO Abiola, was never declared as the elections were annulled by IBB, citing electoral irregularities, which includes vote buying, even as the election was widely declared as the most fair and transparent election in the country's history. It is true that the presidential election was generally seen to be free, fair, and peaceful. However, there was, in fact, a huge array of electoral practices virtually in all the states of the Federation before the actual voting began. It is incredible. In view of all this, I find the conclusion unfortunate but inescapable that the federal British government is guilty of bad faith, pure and simple. No one has accused me of any offense against any known electoral law or regulation. The people of this country went to polls on Saturday, June 12, 1993, and without let or hindrance, chose me as their president. This action led to protest and political unrest, including the resignation of Ibrahim Babangida and a weak interim civilian government, which climaxed in the continuation of military rule in the country with Sani Abacha ascending to power as the military head of state through a bloodless coup later in the year. Sequel to the resignation of the former head of the interim national government and commander-in-chief of the armed forces, Chief Anas Shoneka, and my subsequent appointment as head of state and commander-in-chief 
I have had extensive consultations within the armed forces hierarchy and other well-meaning Nigerians in a bid to find solutions to the various political, economic, and social problems which have engulfed our beloved country and which have made life most difficult to the ordinary citizens of this nation. After General Sani Abacha seized power in 1993, he appointed Major Amza Al Mustafa as his head of security on the 17th of November 1993. Major Al Mustafa was responsible for the security of the Abacha regime and he established a number of elite military security organizations. Following the death of General Sani Abacha on the 8th of June 1998, Al Mustafa assembled the military hierarchy in order to avoid a succession crisis. But with the emergence of General Abdul Salam Abubakar as head of state on the 9th of June 1998, Al Mustafa was removed from office and subsequently arrested. In 2007, there were appeals for Al Mustafa's release, including from former military president Ibrahim Babangida. And on 21st December 2010, Al Mustafa and his co defendants were acquitted of most charges. Al Mustafa was charged with being involved in a plot to overthrow the government. Allegedly, he had conspired with others to shoot down the helicopter carrying the civilian president, Olushegun Obasanjo, using a surface-to-air missile that had been smuggled into the country. This instance is remarkable in history as Nigeria still even as a democratic state with constitutional rights still experience some form of targeted killings, injustice, corruption, tribalism, election rigging and vote buying amongst others. May 29th was initially the official Democracy Day in Nigeria, marking when the newly elected Olushegun Obasanjo took office as the president of Nigeria in 1999. I, Olushegun Obasanjo, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will be faithful that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance and bear true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria to the Federal Republic of Nigeria and that I will preserve and that I will preserve protect protect and defend and defend the Constitution the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria of the Federal Republic of Nigeria so help me God. So help me God. Ending multiple decades of military rule that began in 1966 and had been interrupted only by a brief period of democracy from 1979 to 1983. On June 6th, 2018, President Mohamedou Buhari declared June 12 to be the new Democracy Day to commemorate the democratic election of Chief Moshoud Abiola on June 12, 1993. In what has been adjudged to be Nigeria's freest and fairest elections, which was, however, cancelled by the Ibrahim Babangida Junta. Today, I'm very happy to be present 
and to preside over the commemoration and the investiture marking the formal official federal government recognition of June 12 as National Democracy Day. <laughs> the decision and this event is not meant to be and is not an attempt to open old wounds, but to put right a national wrong. Nigerians of their own free and will voted for late Chief MKO Abiola and the Ambassador Baba Gana Kingibe, the presidential flag bearer and running mate of the Social Democratic Party in the 1993 elections. The government of the day inexplicably cancelled the elections when it was clear who was wanting to be the winners. We cannot rewind the past, but we can at least assuage our feelings recognize that a wrong has been committed and resolve to stand firm now and in the future for the sanctity of free elections. <laughs> Nigerians will no longer tolerate such perversion of justice. With that declaration, June 12 had been adopted and celebrated nationally as Democracy Day in Nigeria, marked by a public holiday and celebration. When President Mohamed Buhari recognized and declared June 12 Democracy Day in 2018, he tendered an emotion landing apology that signaled hope for national reconciliation and unity. In a statement honoring MKO Abiola, Buhari stated that, in quote, the country will no longer tolerate such perversion of justice, end of quote. This declaration presented a symbolic gesture of appeasement, respect, and perceived healing. But since then, how well has the national healing process and reconciliation been? It is ironic that a country that keenly observes Democracy Day to commemorate the democratic election of Chief Moshud Abiola suffers anti-democratic tendencies and human rights abuses which are gradually consuming the polity. Is it safe to say the declaration was just to take glory in marking the date a big national day? If only the democratic regime of the Federal Republic of Nigeria had progressed steadily since inception, June 12 would have been a memorial celebration of political awakening in Nigeria. But sadly, Nigeria has degenerated from a promising nation to a state of collapse. Nigerians have witnessed over the years the resurgent clamor for secession through the propagation of hate and ultra-ethnic agendas, widespread insecurity, a harvest of death and destruction from banditry and kidnapping, hunger, collapsed infrastructure, corruption, and economic downturn. This system has failed its citizens. June 12 serves as another reminder of the tenet of democracy that this administration swore to uphold. Nigerians hope that the promise of a commemorative democracy day will someday revisit all the injustice perpetrated before now.
the catchphrase credible, free and fair elections is neither a political slogan but should rather be a pronouncement of factual witnessing relayed with truth and conviction. TV Africa keeps you lifted 247. Fixes your day and makes it fulfilled with messages of hope and salvation. Sin and the devil, they always walk hand in hand together. Christ too and the ministry of the Lord also will be promoted. This aspect of David's experience we read in our passage of consideration brings this situation very near to ours. His majestic in holiness. Praise the Lord! Groundbreaking shows for every life situation. Parents don't tell lies because that's always a problem. Mm. But in the North, we have abandoned education. If you ask me to do anything for Nigeria, please equip me. It feels great being on Never Ending Platform. Heaven gifted songs to lift your spirit up, pull you out of worry, fear, sadness, and even depression. Keep watching Equa TV Africa. Follow us on all our social media platforms and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the notification button to keep up with our activities. Insecurity is a state of being subject to danger or injury. The anxiety that is experienced when one feels vulnerable and insecure. The rise of insecurity wave in Nigeria since the mid-1990s was as a result of unemployment, economic decline and social inequality, which are supported by inefficient and corrupt security agencies. The idle minds became the devil's workshop. The people who are mostly youths are easily recruited into militant groups and trained in to rob, kill, kidnap, smuggle and hijack to mention but a few. Those affected by insecurity are not only uncertain or unaware of what would happen, but they are also vulnerable to the threats and dangers when they are caught. People engage in business activities, either directly or indirectly, to satisfy unlimited human wants. Therefore, business has become part and parcel of human existence in particular and the global world in general. Nigeria has witnessed an unprecedented level of insecurity since the inception of the immediate past administration to the present democratic political dispensation. The nature of insecurity has been regionalized. Military groups to the south, insurgency in the north, kidnapping in the east and the south, ritual killings in the east and the west, political and non-political calculated assassinations across the nation. In the year 2000, Kaduna riots were religious riots involving Christians and Muslims over the introduction of Sharia law in Kaduna State, Nigeria. It is unclear how many people were killed in the fighting between Muslims and Christians that lasted with peaceful intervals from 21st February until 23rd May 2000. Estimates vary from 1,000 to 5,000 deaths. Eventually, 
the army intervened to end the bloody clashes when it became clear that the police could not control them. This became the first so-called Sharia clashes, the start of the religious riots phase of the Sharia conflict, 1999 to present. Also, the past decade in Plateau State has seen reoccurrence crises across the state in urban and rural areas. Thousands of lives have been lost in these violent conflicts. There has been extensive damage of property and the development prospects of the state have been set back. A committee appointed by the Plateau State Government investigated the period between 7 September 2001 when a week of bloodletting in the state capital left more than 1,000 dead. To 18th May 2004, when President Odishago Nobasanjo declared emergency rule in the state following the massacre of hundreds of persons in the Yalwa community. With the coming to the scene of Boko Haram in 2002, founded by Muhammad Yusuf in northeastern Nigeria, the insecurity situation in Nigeria seemed to have assumed a higher and more complex dimension. Apart from the frequency and intensity of deadly attacks and carnages, insecurity situation in Nigeria cuts across cities, towns, and villages that there is hardly anywhere to run to for cover. Lives and properties are not safe for urban dwellers as well as the rural dwellers. People live in apprehension almost every day. The UN report estimates that through the end of 2020, the conflicts in the Northeast would have resulted in nearly 350,000 deaths, with 314,000 of those from indirect causes, according to the Global Terrorism Index. Boko Haram has contributed to the regional food crisis and famines. However, Boko Haram and Ice Worm later became enemies since 2021, or even a year before. ISWAP gunmen targeted Sheikhau in an attack carried out on May 20, 2021. Several Boko Haram members were killed in the operation, while Sheikhau blew himself up or tried to do so in order to avoid capture. It was the first major clash between the two groups. His death was confirmed by his loyalist, led by Bakura Sal Alaba, in June. I've been in the book business since 2006 um, and personally insecurity has affected my business uh, in several ways. Um, one of the main things that I have noticed is that people don't come out early as they used to. So uh, before now we would open for business like 8 in the morning and customers would start coming in. But these days, because customers don't come out that early, business actually takes off from like maybe 9, 10, at least for those in my own kind of business. And also, when it's getting to 5, people are already leaving town and moving out. So insecurity has kind of re reduced the hours of business. And of course, it reduces the income as well. So in that way, it has affected me. And I'm sure it has affected so many other people in other ways as well. Um, there's very little cash flow in the, in the system, you know, and when there's little cash flow, it affects businesses as well because cash is not flowing around and moving like it should because it's not available in the system. Insecurity has caused more damage. It has caused more harm in our present day society in which you can see that now you cannot just travel on your own. You'll just be having so many thoughts before you get there. You only pray to God that, okay, let me get there in order for me to be, uh, for my family not to pay ransom, in order for me not to get killed, in order for me not to do, there are so many things. Insecurity has brought so many things to us. For example, now the one that just happened in O. These are just worshippers that went to worship to cry out to their God. Then all of a sudden, you can hear that in short, they said unknown government. Who are they on the unknown government for crying out loud? 
Nigeria has been faced with various insecurities since the inception of democracy. The OD massacre was an attack that was carried out on November 20th, 1999 by the Nigerian military on the predominantly Ijo town of OD in Bielsa state. The attack came in the context of an ongoing conflict in the Niger Delta over indigenous rights to oil resources and environmental protection. The subsequent Nigerian civil war lasted two and a half years, led to over a million dead, and ended with the defeat of Biafra. Over the following decades, Nigeria continued to suffer from regional instability and revolt, but Biafra's separatism was mostly dormant until the 2000s. The indigenous people of Biafra was founded in 2012 following the decline of the movement of the actualization of sovereign state of Biafra, Masob, partly to protest evil marginalization and address the long-standing grievances. So when IPOB declared the first Monday seat at home on August 9, 2021, the entire Igbo nation was shaken. Before that date, the IPO propaganda machinery was at its best with threats that anyone who dared leave his house that day would have himself or herself to blame. In fact, the death threats were issued to the people and even security operative in that regard. The IPOP directive insisted that the weekly sit at home would be in force until Namdikanu was released unconditionally by the federal government. The current conflict in the Niger Delta first arose in the early 1990s over tensions between foreign oil corporations and a number of Niger Delta's minority ethnic groups who feel they are being exploited, particularly the Ogoni and the Ijo. Ethnic and political unrest continued throughout the 1990s despite the return to democracy and the election of Obasanjo government in 1999. From 2003 to date, there has been different crises and escalation. Pipeline attacks had become common during the insurgency in the Niger Delta, but ended after the government on June 26, 2009 announced that it would grant amnesty and an unconditional pardon to the militants in the Niger Delta, which will last for six days beginning on August 6, 2009, ending October 4, 2009. I hereby grant amnesty and unconditional pardon to all persons in the commission of offenses associated with militant activities in the Niger Delta. Former Nigerian President Umaru Musayar Adua signed amnesty after consultation with the National Council of State. During the 60-day period, armed youths were required to surrender their weapons to the government in return for training and rehabilitation by the government. From the early 2021, Niger Delta militant groups such as the Niger Delta People's Salvation Force led by Asari Dokubo joined an insurgency in southeastern Nigeria which pitted Biafran separatists against Nigerian security forces, armed Fulani herders and bandits. Asari Dokubo formed the Biafra Customary Government BCG, in March 2021. Igbos in the Niger Delta also joined the Biafran insurgency. Meanwhile, the Niger Delta Avengers continued to target and destroy pipelines while local bandit groups exploited the unrest to stage raids. Nigeria was ruled by the military between 1960 and 1979 and between 1983 and 1999. The military had to intervene because of the large scale of corruption and insecurity of life and property. But some sects have caused some unrest. The Kano 1980 riot was led by Mohammed Maruba, as known as Maitasine, and his followers. It was the first major religious conflict in post-colonial Kano. 
over 4,177 civilians, 100 policemen, and about 35 military personnel were killed, including Maitatine himself. And it's generally regarded as marking the beginning of the Yentasine insurgency. Illegal immigrants were from Niger, Chad, Cameroon, Mali, and Burkina Faso, along with over 6,000 Nigerian Muslim fanatics, killed over 100 policemen while injuring 100 policemen. The army was called and eased the situation before the fanatics could overrun the country. Some analysts view the terrorist group Boko Haram as an extension of the Maitasini riots. Nigeria was better in terms of security in military regime than what we have been experiencing in civilian regime. And I think the way forward is we need credible leaders. Credible leaders, someone that we don't even need to buy any vote. Oh. We don't need to buy any vote. Let's just come out peacefully. Just get your PVC, as far as I'm concerned. Go and vote your candidate. We are not going for party anymore. It's your candidate. Someone that you know that who can deliver. That can give us the security we want. Someone so that some you can vote for somebody that you go and you know, okay, I'm going to church, okay, as far as I'm concerned, I'm safe. I'm traveling, I'm safe. I'm, tra I'm doing this, I'm safe. In my locality, I'm safe. Personally, I don't think that um, it matters whether it's military or civilian that is in power. I believe that what matters is the leadership, the person. If he thinks about the people and loves his people and his country and wants to protect them, he will. So for me, it's not about whether he's a, he's a military man or he's a civilian. It's about the person in leadership. And if he has the willingness and the willpower to want to do the right thing and protect his people. Insecurity is a canker worm that has eaten deep into the fabric of both human and natural resources. Sequel to this development, it has become imperative to strengthen the security system with all sincerity and daggedness that it deserves to make Nigeria habitable for indigents and non-indigents. Remember that information is the lifeblood of any democracy.